Hola, my beautiful humans. This is Jasmine Castillo, and I bring stories and cases from the people of color community, bringing awareness of murdered and missing indigenous women, girls, two spirits, the LGBTQ community, Asian American, Pacific Islander, black indigenous people of color. These are their stories. So welcome to Hands Off, my podcast. What does a bank robbery, an ATM card, and a blue bin has correlations with a story about a missing and murdered indigenous woman? Well, let's get into it. This is Tess's story. Tess Morgan Monet White was born June 30, 1990, in Milwaukee, to Lee and Kim White. Lee and Kim had three children. Lee was Potawatomi, and Kim was Ojibwe Soto. Potawatomi and Ojibwe historically have been allies and are two of the three tribes that make up the Council of Three Fires. There's a little history about the Potawatomi and Ojibwe in Wisconsin. So based on the records of French colonizers, Potawatomi lived in present-day southwestern Michigan in the early 1600s. It wasn't long after that that they were forced to move to the Green Bay area in present-day Wisconsin due to conflict with another tribe. They were pushed to Missouri and eventually to Oklahoma during the Indian Removal Act. Something that I had learned that not all Potawatomi went south summit. They were able to stay where they were. Tess's ancestors are called the Forest County Potawatomi. She had grew up and went to school in this area, which was about three and a half hours from Milwaukee. Uh, so her mother's side was Ojibwe, specifically called the Bad River Band of the Lake Superior Tribe of Chippewa Indians. And to even be more in depth as to why I'm saying she's Ojibwe and that the band uses the name Chippewa, it's because the first two names are referring to the same people. And second, it's mostly importantly, Ojibwe is what Tessa's family uses. So I will respect her and her family by representing that. And these two cultures were influenced in Tessa's life. Tess grew up in the Forest County, Surrounded by the Potawatomi culture she loved, she embraced her love of traditional dancing as a child and hoped to have become a veterinarian. But as things became more and more in her teen years, things got sidetracked. Tess left home at the age of 15. Her father was battling alcohol use disorder and was a repeated DUI, which is a sign of alcohol addiction. And right around the time that she was leaving home at 15, she did move a lot. And she started to use drugs in 2010, at the age of 20. And this was around the time that she actually enrolled herself in a rehab facility located in South Dakota to get herself on the track to achieve more and to become more connected spiritually. She had dreams and she wanted to conquer her childhood traumas and pain and her usage of drugs and alcohol. Tess did struggle off and on, and during that situation, Tess, who was 20 at the time, moved in with her aunt that resided in West Dallas, July 2015. Unfortunately, at this time, her younger brother, who also fell in the generational cycle of drug usage, died of a drug overdose. Generation cycles of addiction is not strictly genetic. 
And it had us a lot to do with the circumstances that either one or both parents contribute to substance abuse in the home. And this is alcohol and drug trauma. And it's a big environmental factor that does affect a lot of families. Charlene and Tess had a good relationship where Tess did contact her once in a while if she was hanging out with friends. I mean, her being 25 years old and staying out is not unusual. What was unusual is when Tess stopped contacting Charlene. And when Charlene tried to call her and check up on her, her phone went to voicemail. And this is when she got concerned. Around May 14th, 2016, Charlene reported her niece, Tess, missing. The last time that she recalled seeing Tess is on May 4th, was around 7.30. And Charlene identified that Tess came home, she grabbed some clothes, she threw them into a bag, and then she left. On May 6, 2016, around 10.30 in the morning, a man walked into a Milwaukee bank, patiently waited in line for the next teller. He pulled up the side of his shirt and exposed what looks to be a gun to the teller and repeated his request. She pulled the money out of the drawer and put it on the counter. When the teller began emptying a second drawer, this guy grabbed whatever was on the counter and left without even waiting for the additional cash from the second drawer. That very moment, the teller hits the robbery alarm while another caller called 911. And police responded to the scene. Looking at CCTV footage, they were able to identify the robber. He did not disguise his appearance. All he was wearing was sunglasses. Police pulled a clear photograph and released it to the local media on May 10th. Anonymous tip came through saying that the man was a 44-year-old Shante Pearson. The officer pulled out an old booking photo and it was quickly identified that Shante Pearson had previous arrests and they compared it to the security footage. So they immediately issued a warrant and had someone surveil his residence, but he never showed up. On the next day, May 11th, there was an anonymous phone call identifying that a police officer in Denver just pulled over a white Chevy Avalanche for a minor traffic violation. The plates on this truck were from Wisconsin, and the driver was a woman who identified herself with a fake name and explained to the officer that she had no ID. And so the officer asked the passenger for their identification, and he handed over his social security card with the name Shante Pearson on it. So as this white Chevy Avalanche was waiting for the officer to run the information, Shante Pearson got out of the truck. Fortunately, the officer did catch up with him and did confirm that this was Shante Pearson and a warrant for the bank robbery from Wisconsin. And the officer did later on identify that the woman who was driving the truck provided a fake name. Her real name was Tiffany Simmons. Tiffany is the friend of Tess. And this will be extremely important when we go back to the day that Charlene reported Tess missing. She had used her sister's name as an alias. Tiffany also had a warrant out for her arrest at the time. And based on Wisconsin court records, it could possibly be tied to a November 2015 arrest for retail theft. And this warrant may have been in relation to a probation violation. But either way, they were both taken into custody in Colorado. Another thing that the police ran through the system is to identify who was the registered owner of the vehicle. And that person was actually Shantae's ex-wife. They had been married for about 10 years when Shantae actually met Tiffany 
And Shantae and Twilight did file for divorce in late 2015. And this, so this was actually a fairly recent divorce. So Shantae had physical possession of it through their separation. However, the police told Twyla that the truck would have to be returned to Milwaukee at her own expense. And that's about 15 and a half hour distance. To actually have it towed back would cost thousands of dollars, if not. So Twyla told her stepson that if he's able to pick up the truck from Colorado, then he can keep it. And so he did. So in the meantime, back in Milwaukee area, West Dallas, Charlene called the police on May 14 to file a missing person report. She had left home 10 days earlier, and Charlene hadn't heard from her since. When the police started to investigate on the case of Tess, they decided to give Tess's cell phone number a call, and they themselves received a recorded message. Also around this time, Charlene had identified to the police officer that Tess just found out that she was two months pregnant on May 3rd, and did inform the father, Alex, and he was later on brought in for questioning by the police on May 20th. Alex did say that he texted Tess on the 4th, and she replied on her text that she was waiting on a ride to the mall and had some clothes and shoes that she was going to return to the store because she needed money. And she did identify to Alex in this text that she was going with a friend named Tiffany. Charlene also identified to the investigators that Tess did discuss that there was money issues around the time that she was being picked up and she wanted to ride to the bank so she could move her money from one account to another. Supposedly this friend, Tiffany, had taken $200 from Tess's account using Tess's ATM card without permission. So here's the timeline. May 4th, Tiffany and Shante pick up Tess in front of Charlene's apartment. May 6th, Shante Pearson is allegedly the bank robber suspect that is on a run with her his girlfriend. May 10th and 11th, an anonymous tip is called in, identifying the white truck and the persons of interest pertaining to the connection of that white truck, Colorado identifying the arrest of Tiffany Simmons and Shante Pearson. May 14th, Charlene file a missing report of Tess White. May 17th, a farmer found the remains and was later identified White's DNA. I would quickly go over the description identifying what Tiffany and Shante had done to Tess because I don't want to give them the time of day and I don't want to glorify on how they tortured and killed this beautiful woman, Tess White and her unborn child. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I also want to honor the grandmother, Janice Madosh Smart, because I agree with her. She wants to remember her granddaughter, the beautiful life that she had before these two people took her away from her family. So on May 4, 2016, Tess left her aunt's home, Charlene, being picked up by a white pickup truck. Tiffany Simmons, along with Shante Pearson, were in the vehicle. During that time, Simmons suspected White of stealing drugs the three were using. And, of course, Tess, in turn, accused of Tiffany using her ATM card. The two women began to argue to the point of physical altercations inside the vehicle. And because of that, Shante stopped the vehicle, and he and Tiffany tied Tess up. He did return to his apartment, leaving the two women in the truck. And that is when Tiffany began punching Tess, burning her with cigarettes, and then started stuffing plastic bags into her mouth. Tess spat them out. Tiffany became more agitated and put a bag and a purse over Tess's head, then used the rope that she was tied up in 
After that, Tiffany and Shantae were doing drugs right after killing this beautiful woman and leaving her in this truck. And on top of that, Tiffany knew that Tess was 10 weeks pregnant. The next day, they stole a car belonging to Tiffany's mother and a plastic storage bin. They used this bin to put Tess's body into. They hid the truck in Whitnow Park, and then they robbed a bank using another car. So here she is in this truck with two people who are strung on drugs, chain of robbing banks throughout different states. They return back to the truck and head west. So by the time they were in Minnesota, they first tried to incinerate Tessa's body. Unfortunately, they miscalculated how much energy it took to incinerate a body. They were unsuccessful. They put Tess's partially burned body back into that blue bin and drove until they found another field in South Dakota. And then they succeeded in a second attempt of burning the remaining of Tess's body. So on May 17th, the farmer did find the remains. And the thing about it, on how they identified the remains so quickly, more than a week to identify, but it takes longer. And here's the reason why it was a shorter period of identifying that this was Tess White. DNA was collected in South Dakota when Tess was in a drug treatment center years earlier. South Dakota has probably one of the best DNA collection laws in the country. That if you are arrested for a felony or any crime involving violence or a sex offense, you get your DNA at the booking, not at the arraignment, not at a conviction, at the booking. And it's put right there, right into their system. And that was the reason why Tess was able to be identified through her DNA from South Dakota, two states away from where she was residing in West Dallas. Between the time that the warrant popped up in the system for Shantae's arrest for robbery, and at the time Tess was reported missing and her body being found, her mother, Kim, became very ill, and she was actually in the hospital in a coma. They were trying to prepare the funeral for Tess. Tess's father was in jail, awaiting sentencing on a DUI. So, Janice Madosh Smart, the grandmother, called the medical examiner in South Dakota to see if she was able to claim the body. And so Janice went to the Bad River Tribal Judge and filed for an emergency guardianship of Tess' mother, Kim, while she was in coma. So the judge granted guardianship on June 1st. By June 3rd, Tess's body, along with the remains of her unborn baby, were sent to Ashland, Wisconsin to prepare for a traditional Ojibwe funeral. Janice wanted to wait until Kim had recovered enough to attend the funeral, but nearly three weeks had gone by, and there wasn't a change in Kim's health. And during this time, Tessa's spirit must rest in the Ojibwe belief, because the spirit stays until the body is buried. So on June 22nd, it's a vigil of fire. It's a 24-hour, round-the-clock wake that lasts for four days. And the fire must be maintained during the entire time. And on the third day of vigil of fire, Tess's half-sister, Shannon, had actually gone to court on behalf of Father Lee from a Milwaukee County judge that signed the order giving Shannon the right to make the decision on the burial and funeral arrangements for Tess. The reason for the dispute between how the burial and funeral arrangements should be is that Tess was enrolled as a member of the Forest County Potawatomi, and she was raised in Forest County, and she should be buried according to their traditions at Stone Lake, on traditional land near Creighton, where her brother was also buried. Because Tess was raised in the Ojibwe tradition, the same tribe her mother was enrolled, Janice wanted to have Tess buried where her ancestors burial at the Bad River Band Reservations near Ashland. All in all, they were able to agree between the two sides of the family 
And so Janice, the grandmother, would take responsibility for the burial of Tess and her unborn child. And because her body was burned, Tess White's family decided to use a dress and moccasins for her ceremonial Ojibwe burial. Tess was finally able to rest two months later. And now here's the part that I'd like to give you the end results. And yes, justice was served. Shante Pearson and Tiffany Simmons did confess to their crimes. 36-year-old Tiffany Lynn Simmons of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and 45-year-old Shante Pearson of West Dallas. Tiffany Simmons is charged with first-degree intentional homicide, hiding a corpse, and kidnapping. And of course, Pearson is charged with felony murder, hiding a corpse, and bank robbery. And both were held on $500,000 bail. In the end, Tiffany was sentenced to life on the kidnapping charges and has been sentenced to the maximum term of 25 years on the kidnapping count with at least 15 years in prison and 10 years on extended supervision that got extended the same as the sentences to be served consecutively. And doesn't get credit for time served. And Shantae got the exact same sentences to be served consecutively and not get any credit for time served. There is 40,000 unidentified remains in the United States, and of 13,000 of those are in NamUs. So when we see a Jane or John Doe case that doesn't get a match, we always think to ourselves, like, did the family even know that they were missing? Were they even reported? And there is times that, yes, there's a high percentage that they are reported, but there is also instances where they were misidentified because the family identifies the missing loved one with a dead name or a misappropriation of their gender or the misappropriation of their ethnicity or the misspelling of their name. One of the things that I would love the listeners to support and learn more, because today is May 5th, the official day for Murdered and Missing Indigenous People Awareness Day. And to some people, there's not much information on how an awareness even begins. Well, it all began in 2013. A beautiful woman named Hannah Harris, her death and injustice started the MMIP. And to become more enthralled and educate yourself on murdered and missing Indigenous people, I provided the link of Hannah Harris's story. If Tess's story touched you and you'd like to at least do a tribute in honor of Tess Morgan Monet White, there is a link where you can actually plant a memorial tree in her honor. I will place that in the show notes. And because this month I will be honoring murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls, two spirits, I would love to give a shout out in supporting the grassroots and awareness for the organization for this month, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous People and Families. This organization is a survivor-led grassroots. They work with families and the loved ones that have gone missing, being murdered, exploited, trafficked, and so forth. The founder of this company is Roxanne White. She is the the boots-to-the-ground organizer because she herself is a trauma survivor. Roxanne is Nimipu, Yakima, Nuxa, and Ani. I'm wanting to support your cause, and hopefully the listeners are right along with me. I will provide her links as well as her Facebook page in the show notes. 
Thank you for listening to Hands Off My Podcast. If you are enjoying the podcast and you'd like to support the mission, I do have a Patreon membership that will help the cause and bring more detail on cases and stories from the people of color community. If you yourself has a lost loved one or a story suggestion, please don't hesitate to contact me at email. Hands off my podcast at gmail.com. And if you are only able to support in another way, please give this podcast a five star rating on Apple or Spotify and continue to listen to upcoming episodes every Thursday, wherever you listen to your podcast. Dios te bendiga.